Well, we're sitting down with our uh, friend of the show, Cyrus Western, uh, Wyoming House Representative for District 51. That's right. Part of Sheridan, uh, you know, city of Sheridan there, Sheridan County. Um, Cyrus, thanks for coming by this morning. Absolutely. We were Glad just, to be here. We were just talking. It's been two years since our first one. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, a lot different. We were, I know. <laughs> what happens in two years? You were, uh, you were probably getting computer butt. You know, you guys were all oh, Zoom. God. That special session was all Zoom because of COVID in 2020. And, yep. Um, yep. But uh, a lot's happened in those two years. So yeah, yeah. No, it kind of seems like it was kind of weird. It seems like it was ages ago, but it also seemed like it was yeah. last month, kind of thing. I know. So yeah, crazy. Um, you got married. In I the, did in the last two years. So I congrats. Did, yeah. yeah, we both uh, we both got some new hardware. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so today, because you guys are uh, rolling into session here in a little bit. Yep, about um, two weeks. I'd love, uh, you know, kind of going back to our first interview with you, um, we talked about um, a couple of your um, kind of hunting bills we had mm-hmm. or some issues that were, mm-hmm. well, that were on our mind, but then kind of COVID probably kind of just squashed a lot of things. But right. um, one thing that I did remember is you and I talked about, you know, migration corridors. Right. And Wyoming... Right. I'm pretty sure it got one, got a grant from the. We did. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I mean, I'm trying to think. Yes. Yeah, so the last two years, there's been a couple of major developments. There's been a bunch of money that, uh, that the U S department of transportation that they got, uh, it, that they are using for grants to partner with some of the local state dot departments across the country. Uh, and one of those was Wyoming. And so I think nationwide there was, it was like three or 400 million bucks that the feds had had authorized for, sure. for these types of, projects across the country and so yeah. uh, wideout was pretty good at going after some of that funding going after private funding match dollars all that kind of thing uh you know in wyoming in the legislature you know we love match dollars if yep. we can get matching money from you know local municipalities you know nonprofits, private institutions are obviously uh, the federal government that's that's something that happens a lot in wyoming yeah. so yeah yeah um yeah and talk about the importance of these corridors and do we know have we picked the one yet in wyoming yet yeah well we you know, there's a lot. There's the, the most famous ones, I think, are the kind of the pilot ones. Ha- pro- projects happen in the western part of the state between okay. Rock Springs and Pinedale. Sure. Uh, and they've been very successful. I think, you know, for example, the um, um, uh, uh, Trapper's Point uh, under uh, underpass, prior to building these underpasses and these wildlife crossings, they were experiencing about 120 to 130 uh, wildlife collisions every year. Oh. And after they installed the fencing and they installed the underpasses and the overpasses, that number went down to around two or three a year. Oh, so wow. they're, yeah, they're incredibly effective. Yeah. And, uh, and so th- there's been some studies that have been done uh, in conjunction with Game and Fish, the University of Wyoming, and other private biologists. And they've identified these hot spots, if you will, across the state of Wyoming where there are these areas that are just high collision areas. And so slowly but surely, the idea is to one by one start building these these crossings in these locations and, and start getting those numbers down. Cool. So that's that's the idea. Awesome. So yep. can we can look forward to that a little bit. Yep. Yeah, um, we've got the most recent one is is I-25 near KC. Okay. Uh, that's kind of been the most recent and high profile one. Um, that's an area that's a very a high collision yep. zone and uh, they're just about done with that project. So it's it's been a really it's been a big process. It's been an expensive process, but it's one that's going to yield a lot of results and be really beneficial for wildlife, for hunters, for road safety, those kind of things. Sure. So, yeah. And, you know, I-80 yep. is a very hot topic. And uh, Cyrus, you were just talking about that. We've done studies where when they're trying to migrate south, yep. they just hit that barrier. Yeah, that was the Wyoming Migration Initiative, who does a lot of really good uh, research on this. They do a, a ton of in the field data collecting. And one of the things that they learned from a lot of the research from this calling project that they did was that during the summertime, these mule deer herds would go up into the high country in the Yellowstone ecosystem, spend their summertime gaining weight, getting nutrients so they can survive the winter, and then they migrate back down to the south, and it all virtually just stopped right at the I-80 line. And you see this congregation of these little dots. Mm -hmm. You can go on their their website and see the maps where it just stops at I-80, where they clearly want to continue migrating south into the Uinta Range and, and some of those other lowland uh, high forage areas and they just stop. Yeah. So that's one of the top priorities, I think, of Game and Fish, of YDOT, and some of these these research institutions that are trying to uh, to reconnect some of these these corridors. So yeah. again, it's going to be probably the most expensive one because you know I eighty is it's eight lanes. It's 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 pretty big. Yeah. Or excuse me, yeah, four lanes. Excuse me. Yeah. So it's but it's you know I think it's like 120, 130 feet. 
So it's just a really big undertaking. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and we were just talking about, you know, that there's now talks about maybe we should just reroute I-80 all together right. to different safer things. And that's where we were talking about, like, we can find yeah. a balance maybe, you know, we don't yeah. have to go to the extremes, but. I think, yeah, it's, it's a little excessive. And, and like I said, there's this on the two extreme ends of the spectrum where you have the super, you know, environmentalist component who think humanity needs to recalibrate its lifestyle entirely around the existence of wildlife and nature, which I obviously think is going too far. Then you've got the other end of the spectrum who doesn't care about these things yeah, at don't all. Don't do anything. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, in Wyoming, we obviously have really important issues that I think are our top priority, like economic development, those kind of things, jobs and the economy. But there are other things that are important to me. And I think important to a lot of people, yeah. our quality of life that we have these, these beautiful mountains and we have a thriving, uh, you know, wildlife that mm. we can, uh, that we can hunt and that we can, that we can exist with. So that, that's why it's important to me personally. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, that'll be something we'll keep an eye on, but sure. Probably not in the near future, but yeah, absolutely. It's starting to pick up steam a lot. That's yeah. for sure. Um, was there anything in the last two years that uh, hunting land related that? Yeah. Kind of the, the, the big initiative for me last year, and it was a little bit controversial, but I really felt strongly that it needed to happen was if you talk to sportsmen of any stripe and you ask them to list their top three issues Almost without exception, they're going to say public access is a big, is a major issue, yeah, and a lack thereof, especially in the eastern part of the state. And I, I can totally relate to that. There's been times I've been hunting where you know I've gotten to a good point and I see high quality game or good habitat where I think there's game, and as a straight line, it would be a mile, two miles tops. But because of all this fragmented private land, I have to hike four, five, six miles all the way around mm -hmm. to stay on public to get to where I want to go. We've all had that experience as, yes. as, as hunters, and it's, it's, it's a really frustrating one. And so, again, depending on where, who you talk to on the spectrum, yes. some people think, well, we should just be able to go across private land, which I strongly disagree with because that's private property. So I think how can we come up with ideas that are within the bounds of what we're dealing with that respect private property rights, but also give the sporting public the thing that they're really after, which is access mm -hmm. to, to high quality habitat. And so I think the best way is to pay them, right? Yep. And so what I did was I took the conservation stamp, which prior to cost right around 12 bucks, and I raised that to, to 2150, which again, some people, folks were upset, but a lot of folks I also spoke with really understood once they realized what the money was going for. And the money is going towards two things. 85% of that was going to... Uh, a, a specific game and fish fund that game and fish could only use to pay landowners to access, or excuse me, to negotiate access agreements across private. Right. It, it, the language is that it could not be rated for other uses or to go hire a bunch of employees. It had to be used for access. Yep. And the other thing is the other 15% that it generated on an annual basis could be used for these wildlife crossings and these migration corridors. Wonderful. Which is not directly related to access, but could be depending yeah, well, on. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's in the realm of sportsmanship because if you talk to hunters, one of the things they love to hunt the most is is mule deer, and we know that if we can reduce these wildlife collisions, we can improve the 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 quality and quantity of these populations. So it can really help these these right. herds get back on track and and get back to a healthy level. So, uh, so that's what the funding was for. Again, there's always that ten percent or so who are always going to be mad at you no matter what you do, and I heard from them for sure. Uh, but this was thing I think that was that, that we needed. It's as a sportsman, we either suck it up, you know, put our money where our mouth is and actually yep. start paying for access or we can just, you know, keep whining. Yeah. You know, the way I, I always say is complaining is like a rocking chair it gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Yep. So that was kind of the, uh, the idea behind that. And so it was, it was a big push because there hasn't been any sort of increased funding on a consistent basis for access in almost 30 years. Sure. Uh, 20 years actually. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, that's, that was something I worked on and worked hard for. Yeah. So. And, and, uh, you know, what has been the response from private owners that have these, these easements and things like that, that have been paid for? Yeah. So, I mean, to, to get into the weeds on it, it's, it is a little complicated because if you look at how game and fish pays landowners now, there's multiple, um, access vehicles. You can okay. say, so there's these, these, um, these walking areas, right? There's hunter management areas. There's wildlife and hunter management areas. And so certain have uh, certain options have certain stipulations attached. Oh, sure. But if you look at how they are paid and how much they're paid, it's pennies in the dollar. It really is. 
This gives Game and Fish the ability to go to these private landers and say, pick your terms and pick your price. And we'll see if we can meet you somewhere in the middle on that. Yeah. Um, that does mean that for certain access, they might have to go back and renegotiate a better price for some of these landowners, sure. which I'm fine with. Uh, but that's what it does for, for Game and Fish. It gives them yeah. the financial muscle to say, hey, we can actually pay you. And yep. you know, I've talked to landowners and I've talked to game wardens who've said, you know, we'd be you know, more willing to let hunters on our, across our property, but it just pays nothing. Sure. It just pays absolutely nothing. And now this gives Game and Fish the ability to say, Hey, we'll pay it for what it's worth. Yeah. So, yeah, it seems like it's flexible. Like you said, they can go to them and say, Hey, yep. You tell us what you want to do and how you want to do it. And we'll try and work with yep. you. Yeah. Yep. There's programs. If you want to have a more long term, broader commitment, there's options for that. Like a, um, a WHMA. If you want a shorter one where you can terminate it or repeal it pretty quickly, you can do these walk-in areas uh, that again, uh, landowners can, can abrogate almost at a moment's notice sure so awesome yeah and like you said for the sportsman you know this is where if there's issue with the landowner and the game and fish it's like well you know if it's especially if it's a money issue right well you guys need to pony up you know if this you know exactly if you're gonna cry wolf about it, it's like put your money where your mouth is and help exactly pay for the access and i think the states that have done a good job like montana they have the um uh, the block management system which is really well funded if you just look at how many funding sources they uh, they draw revenue from and how much they get. It's better than almost any state in the country. And coincidentally, they have some of the best hunting access there right. as well. So it's, it, I mean, it's a pretty direct correlation between the access you get and what you're paying. So, so yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that is going well. Yep. We'll keep working on that. Absolutely. Um, Cause I think that's, um, I think you proposed that two years ago. Is that right? Or yeah, this mean, there's been a lot of stuff that's been debated, but th- to me, that was the the lowest hanging fruit where we could yeah. kind of abide by our values as, as folks who, who, who emphasize private land ownership, but mm-hmm. also how can we get what we want that everyone is incentivized in a positive way yep. uh, to, to cooperate and, and buy in. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, one other thing I remember we talked about was, um, and I think Zach maybe asked you was a uh, 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 corner hopping. Um, the that's issue. a big one. Yeah. And I'll just say it. I'm in favor of corner hopping. I really am. Um, and this is why. I think it is absolutely possible. If you just, you know, if you drop that perfect, you know, kind of grid, mm-hmm. it is possible to step from one piece of public across onto another piece of public yep. without setting a foot on private. So technically you haven't trespassed. Yep. Look, trespassing is trespassing, whether it's you set one toe on someone's private property or you're a mile in. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I obviously do not advocate that or support that at all because, you know, private property rights. But if it is possible for someone to step from one piece of public to another, I don't see how that's how that's an infringement on private property. I really don't. And you would I mean, I think the stat was you would unlock uh, over a million acres of public land by corner hopping by legalizing it. Yeah. It's not codified in state statute or agency regulations, but it was actually an opinion by the attorney general. And I think 2005, Pat Crank, uh, when he said that all the land, all the air above your land is also yours as well. And any infringement on that is an infringement on your private property, which I personally you know, disagree with. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's that's a big thing. And there's a case that's being um, right now being litigated in Carbon County. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you've heard about this, but some hunters from... Um, I think like Illinois or uh, some Midwestern state. Sure. We're corner hopping on some land down in, in Carbon County. I believe they're antelope hunting. And one of the local landowners uh, pressed charges and they're going through the, and they're being charged through the uh, the district attorney. And so they're fighting it and they're oh, trying wow. to get all the way to Supreme Court. Now, again, I absolutely do not advocate or condone breaking the law. Sure. The rules are rules. They need to be followed. But in the event that this gets overturned, uh, that would be an awesome thing for for the sporting community. Yeah, I really do think so. Yep. It's gonna have uh, there will be byproducts and consequences as with everything. Sure. But yes. I think that that would be a huge win for sportsmen. Yeah. Well, and I think what you mentioned last time we talked about this two years ago was the problem is, um, you, you know, when I was a landman, I'd be out there in these in these areas and uh, th- those fences. You know, you look at fences and the landowner's like, well, you know, here's the corner. Yep. And you'd have to get a GPS and they could be 10 feet off, 20 feet off, or they could be spot on. And, right. And that's where we fall into this, you know, did you actually corner hop? Did you trespass? And Exactly. And I think there is a technical argument, I think, that needs to be addressed as well. And that those GPSs, Onyx is accurate to, I think, within a meter, mm-hmm. which is good, but not good enough. I think it probably needs to be 
survey corners where you actually yeah. have, you know, a professional land surveyor come out and put that He's cap in the it. ground and yeah. say like this to the inch yep. is where the corner actually is. Cause that way we can truly say stayed on public the whole time. Yeah. So, yep. One rule I found when I was landman was just call all those landowners around you. Like, yeah. <laughs> if, yep. you, if you know one's going to be a little difficult to work with, it's like, don't piss them off. Like, no, that's, totally. It's yeah. their private property, you know? And, so. and look, I've talked to a lot of ranchers about this. And one of their big concerns is that should this case make it to the Supreme Court, should it be overturned and corner hopping becomes legal, um, that there is a real serious concern that it will just be a free for all for the hunting public. And there's going to be this cascade of orange Mm -hmm. uh, across their, across their land. I think to an extent that's an exaggerated fear, but I also understand their point, which is why I personally also advocate for an increase in enforcement, excuse me, in funding for enforcement. Yes. Talk to any game ward and they'll all say, I would love to have five more of me because that way we can really do a much better job at enforcing the rules on the books. Yep. And I, I, I think that's true. I think, if that does get overturned, corner hopping becomes legal. I think we absolutely do need to hire more game wardens to really enforce. You can cross at this corner and only this corner, you know, yep. and the ones who are, uh, who are trespassing, give them their trespassing ticket and send them on their way. Right. So, yeah. Like you said, there's going to be consequences and cause and effects totally. on, on, on that case. So absolutely. Uh, wonderful. Um, so what are you looking forward uh, to this year in this session? Um, you know, do you have any bills that you've, working up right now or are yeah. you kind of focused it is a um it's a budget session again it's so pretty short yeah yeah yep. yeah um in terms of what i'm personally working on it is kind of sports been related mm-hmm. the a issue that has been important in this county specifically in my district has been this land exchange mm. and to folks listening the brief history is if you look at all the organic acts, when a lot of these Western states came into the union, they were given millions and millions of acres of land to be held in trust by the state uh, for the benefit of public schools, how you monetize this land to to benefit schools. That was all up for debate. And each state has their own methodology and approaching some states like Nevada sold off 90% of that state land. Wyoming has still retained quite a bit. I think it's right around 60, 70%. Okay. Uh, but that land has to be managed for, for K-12 schools. Right. The majority of it, like yes. 90 plus percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so with that that kind of framing this the situation, what some folks do or what is legally possible to do is for a rancher to apply for a land exchange saying, I'm willing to trade you tract A of private land for tract B of public land, of state land. Yep. Yeah, of, of, of state-owned land. And in theory, I can understand why it, it's, it can be a good thing. In practice, though, especially over the last 30 years, there have been exchanges where I believe, and I think that it's beyond clear, that the, the public really got shafted. I mm-hmm. mean, trading away state land that had really high-quality game on it, you know, big deer, big bulls, or, like, really good access to fishing for really not-so-great private land. Yeah. Uh, and, and so in the sporting community, it's created this dynamic where people are once bitten, twice shy. And so that's kind of the context of, of this particular situation where right. a landowner out in my district has applied for a land exchange. And I believe along with a lot of their local sportsmen believe that the land he is offering up is not as high a quality as what the state currently has. Right. And so we're kind of pushing back against that. And we've been negotiating with him and, he is a good guy. I've sat down with him multiple times. He's a nice guy. He's been nothing but respectful. I've been really encouraging folks to focus on the land exchange, not the landowner. Yep. And keep it focused on the policy and the substance. But I think part of the problem is that this is a process that deals with taxpayer assets, mm-hmm. land that we all collectively own, that's not very transparent uh, at all. Yeah. The way the process is now is someone makes the application or submits it. It's not till about two years later is the public even made aware that this has happened. Right. So by the time the public is made aware, the cake is already baked at this point, which to me, I mean, I think it's BS. I, mm-hmm. I really do. Yeah. So the piece of legislation I'm working on this session, getting back to your question is it, it basically states that upon submission of an application for land exchange, the office of state lands and investments, which manages all the yep. state owned land has to disclose this application within 30 days of it being submitted. Gotcha. So that way from square one, everyone is involved. Everyone's aware. Yep. Everyone's aware. 
no one feels like they got the rug pulled out from underneath them and yeah. everyone feels uh, included in the process because right. there's some really nice chunks of state land out there yes. that on the private market would fetch a lot of money yeah like this particular one it's right at the base of the big horns like it's 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 really good land yeah um so that's kind of the big thing uh, i'm working on perfect uh, over sessions so. yeah no i remember that that was about a year ago i think it became you, you know, it came to the public and yep, last April, um, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, somebody had sent it to me and I was looking over and I was like, Holy cow. I'm, you know, and that's it. Yep. Like you said, it's the policy and, and how the procedures are laid out. So that's awesome that I love that. It's going to be, you know, 30 days within it. Yep. Um, is there, is there any, have you had any talks with legislators about, um, you know, one step at a time here, but, sure. um, one thing I've always thought is the, the evaluating process. Cause that's a very broad, you know, cause, um, that piece of property could be, you know, subdivided and that's worth a lot yep. of money or, you know, just the hunting value of it is alone is valuable. So yep. is that kind of the next step? If we, you know, step one is, you know, let's do the 30 days and then maybe step two is like, okay, how do we evaluate these state pieces? Absolutely. I mean, you know, if I had a magic wand, I would run a bill that just ban these things entirely. Oh, sure. I just think that by and large, they're, they're kind of a rip off. Like you said, though, I think it starts in steps. First step is to get this transparency component in there. Um, I, I do think that if you look at the appraisal process and how this land is evaluated, there's a pretty high element, I think, of, of subjectivity in there. Mm-hmm. If you look at the appraisal report for the state land, I think it's very greatly undervalued. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the land that the lander is offering up is overvalued. Right. And also, if you look at the appraisal report, their valuation is based off that land being sold off for development. So this land would then become into state possession. And then all of a sudden the state is now selling it for developing land. Oh, sure. For, which kind of puts the state of Wyoming in the real estate speculation business, which I don't think the state should be yep. involved. Yeah, in. I agree. Um, I didn't know that. Cause I thought it would just be, you know, it was kind of hunting. So you would think it, they'd use that property for hunting. Oh, so that's interesting. So this is the rub with hunting is this, is that if you, again, look at our, our state constitution, you look at our statutes, OSLI has to manage that state land on behalf of the beneficiary, which is K-12 schools, meaning oh. it can only really consider things that are going to generate money for schools. Sure. So right now, obviously hunting is, a, is, a, is an amazing thing. It's, it's great for local communities, but it doesn't generate money that directly goes into to benefit the K-12. Yep. into our K-12 funds, into what's called the CSPLF, the Common School Permanent Land Fund. Yeah. Zero money goes in there. So technically OLSI gets to say, Sorry, sportsmen. Like, we appreciate that you're pissed off, but we don't have to take your concerns yeah. into consideration. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So, that, I mean, th- that, and that's what, to me, what I think is most frustrating is his, the proposal, as it's, as it's submitted, fits all the criteria to be approved. Right. Every single criteria. That's why we've been fighting really hard or working hard to negotiate with a landowner to try to find some kind of compromise or middle yep. ground because absent some kind of deal, it's going to get approved. Mm-hmm. Or... There's all the criteria to right. justify its approval as it sits right now. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, that's so see a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts there that I a didn't ton. think about that. So, a ton. Interesting. Well, I'll definitely keep an eye on that. And I'm glad uh, yep. we had you in to talk about, it. I kind of forgot about that uh, land swap. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a serious, yeah. it's a serious thing. And there are people who are, mm-hmm. who are pissed. Yep. Uh, yeah. Cause it's, it's not just an issue for up here. Cause I've heard, you know, even in Johnson County, there's been some land swaps that some people are like, man, that, you know, um, absolutely. Yeah. Some so. of the land swaps that went down under the Geringer administration back in the, in the nineties were just like, it blew my mind that these got as far as they did and got approved. Yeah. I mean, thousands of acres of really good state land is now private access is completely shut off. Yep. Yep. Uh, so that's why sportsmen get pretty touchy about these land exchanges. Yep. So, well, and I think like you said, and I'm, I'm hopeful to see what, what happens in the session, but I think just 30 days notice, I think people will, I, I don't see any, any way anyone would stop that. Cause it's just, we're getting it out there. People know. And if a community doesn't you know, yeah, do I anything think about it, if then anything, like, I guess, there you go. it'll separate the wheat from the chaff, the good applications that are a true win-win for everybody. Mm-hmm. Everyone's going to see that and say, Hey, this deal actually gives us better access or gives us that, you know, higher quality land to hunt. You know what? I, I think we can get on board with this. And yeah. I, not all sportsmen, but I think a lot of sportsmen would appreciate something like that yeah, and saying, absolutely. You know, we are willing to support this because it truly is a win-win for the state, for the landowner. 
and for the sporting public. Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. We got to give uh, some time to our sponsors here. So, uh, first one is a brand new sponsor, Fine Sight and Sound. Um, they are the premier audio visual integration company serving uh, the greater Wyoming area, but they're based right here in Sheridan, Wyoming. If you own a business or you're building a home or renovating your home and you want the best sensory experience, go to the experts at Fine Sight and Sound. Go to their website at F ssavpro.com or call Aaron Perez 307-751-6585 they do when I say sensory they do like automatic lighting and sound system and golf simulator so if that's something that you want to do for your home or business <laughs> find sight and sound also, this episode is brought to you by Fly Sheridan, the Sheridan County Airport. They have direct flights to Denver International Airport. Um, they have three or four a day, um, which they're increasing that. Sheridan County is growing, and they're having more air traffic. Um, you can book your direct flights at united.com. Cyrus, you've probably been on a couple of those flights. Many times. Yeah. They're, the service has gotten so much better since it's awesome. when I was a kid. I can't even remember who it was. Great Lakes. Yeah, Great Lakes. They were awful. <laughs> they were trash. So the, uh, there was like this, like, literally it was a... It was a pop can with wings. Yeah. You just got bounced around, and it was the worst. Like, that's what scared me from flying out of Sheridan for a long time. Because as a kid, I was like, man, these are scary. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's a scary. I felt like, you know, we were in, like, uh, you know, one of those adventure role-playing video games where it starts off, there's the propeller jet that crashes in the jungle, and you right. have to escape. <laughs> it's like, Ugh. Yeah, but now it's uh, great, great planes from United. Um, I will say I've had... <laughs> Bad experiences, not from them, just because, you know, weather in Wyoming is not good. <laughs> That's <laughs> you, the one thing is tough is the yeah, weather component. Yes, yeah. Yep. Uh, but, uh, no, they're great, um, and you can connect to any flight out of Denver, which is awesome, and it, you've got three or four options a day now. So um, our great sponsor is there. Um, are there any um, – Cyrus, is there any other issues? So we talked about the, the land exchange. That's mm -hmm. kind of something that yep. you, you're going to head up that bill there. Um, but are there some other issues you've heard – um, that your constituents are worried about, um, that you're kind of keeping an eye on yeah. when you head down there for the house. Yeah. Well, one thing that's really topical right now, because it's, it's really important is the whole inflation thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's real, it's serious and, and it really hurts folks, especially the working class. So I think there's some, some people who are talking about doing some kind of temporary uh, tax relief on the gas tax. Oh, okay. Uh, which I would honestly, I'd be okay with because that's something that can directly help working class folks. It's not a, a giveaway to, you know, to the 1% or any of that stuff. It's, sure. it's just a little bit of relief for, for your working class folks. You have to drive to work every day. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. And I think I, uh, it'd be great to hear if that came out through that. Um, yeah. Are there, um, Oh, this, we had Bo Biteman in yesterday and, um, oh, cool. something that you guys are probably going to talk a lot about in the house, you know, inflation and then i think you know what to do with the arpa funds you know right. that was something that um right yeah that's going to be a ton of debate um you know i obviously a lot of that ideas. Was a bad idea to pretty much have kind of monopoly money in the first place yeah. but now that we have it you know i, I don't know I'm, there's a ton of stipulations that come with that federal yeah. money what you can spend it on that you can't just cut and replace that funding for something else so i, I mean i think putting in savings is probably or as much as we can is smart because and you make your money work for you. Yep. And that creates money that we have, you know, years on down the road. So uh, there's a lot of really interesting ideas out there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think if we are going to spend it, it should not be on brick and mortar institutions. In Wyoming, we have this thing where we, I don't know, how would you call it? Almost like lottery syndrome, right? You get all this money, you want to buy a, a brand new spanking house and buy a brand yep. new spanking car. Yep. It's all shiny. You can show it off to your friends. But I would much rather invest in institutions that, that pay off dividends down the road. Yeah. You know, investing, like, for example, there's talk of having a, a, a PA school in Wyoming, building oh. one of those, which are, you know, I honestly think it's great because, you know, if you look at communities that are thriving, it's that they have those kind of institutions that attract that intellectual capital, mm -hmm. the people that want to come there, who are going to go, who are smart, who are educated, who are going to go out and get those good paying jobs and live in our communities. Explain physician. real quick a uh, PA school. Yeah, so a physician's assistant. So oh, gotcha. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you know, which is, you know, it's like having a nursing school kind of thing. It's, yep. it, it really generates those. And if you go to any hospital in Wyoming, uh, almost without exception, there's going to be job postings for PA positions that are open for these physician's assistants. Absolutely. And, you know, I think they start at like high 60s and the 70s. Some PAs make over 100 grand, yeah. depending on if they're 
a specialized PA. Sure. So um, you know, those are the kind of things I'm open to because it keeps that kind of intellectual capital there, it diversifies our economy, uh, and, and it, it it brings the right people we want here and just not yep. fancy new buildings. Well, and it solves a need, like you said. And, it, you know, I, I would attest to that, that almost probably every hospital here probably needs PAs. and, and uh, Yep. Um, so it solves a need also. So, um, And I think, I think anyone, you know, I told this to Bo that, you know, I think – Anyone that just says, "Yeah, let's try and save it into these in the, into our funds," or you know, uh, get in into these uh, diversification type ideas, like yep. I don't think anyone's going. The problems, the the fun part's going to be the debating it, <laughs> right? You know, how it, much goes where, and absolutely, everyone has their pet projects. <laughs> yeah. So yep. yeah, yep. no, we'll see. That that's going to be a big one. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, should have started off with this a little bit, but um, sure. You know, how did you think? I, I want to try and frame this in the right way. You know, I think, um, I think Wyoming did a great job throughout the pandemic. Um, I think the legislature and the governor did a great job with whatever it was, you know, the restrictions and trying to handle that. And, uh, um, the budget, you know, that was a big thing. You know, mm -hmm. we were rolling into uh, 2020 and 2021 with some shortfalls, but, mm -hmm. um, what were some things that stuck out to you, you know, as, um, as a state that we did really well, um, throughout the pandemic? Well, you know, I'd have to think about that. Um, I would say a lot of us do with just our resiliency. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, you know, what's the old saying? Tough times don't last, but tough people do. And I think that really applies not just to us in Sheridan, but to us as, as a state that despite these really tough times that we were going through, and I know, it, you know, it, there was a lot of controversy around it, but I think at the end, a lot of folks, the vast majority, I think, were focused on, on making it through this. And mm -hmm. I know, obviously, it, it, it's not over, but I think we are working really hard to 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 live our best lives and to focus on what what is in our control. And so, I think just seeing the way our communities rebounded. I mean, I think the Chamber of Commerce, Dixie, and some of those folks, they raised like two hundred and fifty grand or something, you know, in that in that most dire moment of need. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard dozens and dozens of stories of just people in the community who aren't well known who stepped up in these huge ways. I mean, there's a gal who lives out in Bighorn that I heard about who for like three or four months straight during the worst of it brought in meals for nurses and PAs and doctors in the hospital. I think every single day Wow. for like a hundred plus days straight, seven days a week stories like that. I mean, those are awesome. Yeah. And so I think that's what I thought was the most impressive or that we co collectively did the best. Yep came together and absolutely um, got through it. I love that. Um, yeah, those were all kind of my prepared questions. Um, you know, one thing we were kind of all talking about and I'll kind of get your thoughts on this one is sure. Um, you know, cryptocurrency, I think, yep. you know, the, the last couple of years have been tough because pandemic budget shortfall, you know, we're trying to figure out other things, but um, here in this office, we were kind of talking about like, man, you know, Wyoming passed some super cool legislation and we kind of need to get, get some things out in the forefront yep. with this cryptocurrency. Um, what are you kind of hearing yeah. or maybe what are, what are, what have been your thoughts on? Yeah, no, I'm that's, I would say if you ask me, what are some of the most important things I've worked on and I'm most proud to have worked on, I would hands down say it's the stuff that we've done around digital assets and blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. We passed legislation that was truly ahead of the curve that no one was even talking about. And if you look at what other legislatures around the country are doing, they followed our lead almost verbatim in the sense that they have introduced bills in their legislatures that are word for word the same, the bills that we introduced in ours. And it comes back to that old saying, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, yes. which is true. Uh, there were people who told us we were crazy, that it was a waste of time and energy and all that stuff. But th there's a core group of us where we didn't listen to those folks, where we really saw an opportunity. We truly believed in this emerging technology and this, in this emerging trend. Mm -hmm. And we pushed hard and we got some really big things through and it. And it's starting to pay off. You know, one of the big criticisms was, you know, this isn't going to be benefit Main street, Wyoming. Like, how's this going to help us? You know, other than, you know, just some crazy nerds in a basement somewhere. <laughs> uh, that criticism came from a lot of the gray hairs in, in the legislature, sure. some of the old fogies. <laughs> and look, I get it. You want to be, you know, skeptical of any new emerging thing mm -hmm. uh, but it's absolutely starting to pay off for example there is a company called uh tencent t-e-n-c-e-n -E if i recall correctly they just moved to cheyenne about two months ago three months ago 
23, 24 employees, and they specifically focus on blockchain technology and capability. So this is 20 plus people who moved here, a company yep. that we didn't pay them a single dime, not one dime, not any of kind of incentive or program or any of that stuff. They moved here because of our legislation and because of the, the pro business culture we've created. Uh, and these are, these aren't jobs busting tables that pay 12 yeah. bucks an hour. I mean, these are all jobs. I looked on Glassdoor equivalent jobs are starting at like 80 grand. Yep. Uh, so Good that was some jobs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just an example. We've got two of these charter crypto banks in Wyoming. Uh, and there's another four or five that are kind of circling right now that are in the process of applying as well. So that's an example of something that where we have diversified our economy, it is starting to pay dividends. These people are buying homes, putting their kids in school, those kind of things. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, so I'm super proud of what we've, we've gotten done. You know, some of the stuff we're working on now revolves around the concept of digital identity. Mm. What does that mean? How do we protect it? Because um, that's I, fascinating. Yes. Yeah, it's really yeah. interesting because I believe, you know, if we wind the clock back 15 years, Facebook's coming out, Google, all these, you know, the big tech companies, average folks, you know, outside of a very small subset of, of technologists, the vast majority of people had no idea, had no concept of digital identity, right? Of like... Mm -hmm. Hey, when I sign this petition online, they're getting my address, my email address, my you know phone number, all that stuff. What rights do I have? Do I have a privacy interest in that information? And so we're working on things around the third party doctrine, which I think is a real problem. And it's been just a gross violation of our privacy rights because right now it's set up where once you give your information away, you sever your your privacy interest in that in that data of yours. Sure. Whereas stuff like we're working on with digital identity. Uh, actually, is, actually, that is still your private information, and they can't just do willy-nilly what they want. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Same with the stuff we saw with Cambridge Analytica and the Facebook scandal and how bad actors were intentionally manipulating that data to manipulate public opinion. You know, that's the kind of stuff I think that, that we're working on that I think we're doing a really good job in ensuring that, that you are, along with my political philosophy of, you know, you have your sovereignty over yourself and your own privacy – of ensuring that you're in the driver's seat yeah. of your privacy and it's not, you know, yep. Facebook. Yeah. So. Yeah. That man, that doesn't, that wasn't even in our conversation. We're talking, you know, we've been more on the financial side, which yeah. that's even more fascinating, but that, um, that sounds very important. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. I mean, and I think if you get to know some of the original blockchainers and crypto guys, these folks are, are deep technologists. I mean, this is their, you know, they're kind of libertarian leaning in, in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I really like that about them because I, we have a lot of overlap yes. in our values and political beliefs and right. stuff, but that's a big thing for them is, is they wanted to be able to, to create this, this ecosystem where they are in charge of their own privacy. And I mean, I think a lot of it, part of my reasoning and a lot of the folks that we worked with in that legislation was if you go back to the 08 crash, the big winners out of that system were the big banks, the ultra wealthy, all that stuff. And I have no problem in principle with them winning, but a lot of poor people lost, yes. right? A lot of average Americans got the short end of the deal. And so I think there are a lot of people who are just really frustrated with the status quo and how it wasn't the financial status quo. And so that's why I got involved and supported from the beginning because it created this opportunity for uh, average folks and just people who were so disenfranchised by the status quo. It gave them an opportunity to be financially empowered of their own, of their own wealth. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a really, a really awesome thing. It's still in its emerging phases and there's a lot of development yet to happen. But I think if this puts everyday folks in the driver's seat of their own you know, financial autonomy, I, I think that's awesome. Yeah. So Yeah. And Wyoming's at the forefront. So that's uh, great to hear. So yep. we'll be looking for some yeah. of those. Uh, again, it's probably not the forefront, you know, it's a budget session and all that stuff, but um, yep. Glad to know that you're in that group we so are. we can always pull you in for that. I, I will say the big thing that we've been working on is, is decentralized autonomous organizations. That's been a big thing. Um, and we were the, the, yeah, last year, we were the first state in the nation to give these DAOs LLC protection. And I, I think it's any, if anything, it's a continuation of Wyoming being trailblazers in a sense. If you go back to the 1970s, Wyoming created the LLC. Yep. The Limited Liability Company Act of 1973. We were the first ones to do that. People thought we were crazy. 40 years later, everyone, you know, LLCs are the backbone of our, of, of our commerce and mm -hmm. our economy. Yeah. And so uh, giving that kind of protection to these DAOs, I think, is, is huge. And it really is trailblazing. We've talked to people from across the spectrum who are uh, 
who are taking advantage of this. I mean, I think we've seen 120 DAOs incorporated in Wyoming because of that law. Awesome. Again, we're the first to do it. Now you look at legislators across the country, they're taking our bill almost word for word and introducing it in their own legislatures. So awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Um,